Welcome to Fight Club. There really is only one rule of Fight Club. If your name is Chris Redfield, you have to fight. Whoa. What? The ancient art of fisting is a superior fighting style mastered only by a select few that had the power to turn even the toughest of boulders into dust. So just imagine for a moment a what-if scenario, if you will, where Wesker decided like Thanos that if you wanted a job done properly or needed an amber retrieving, you should just do it yourself. Tell me something, viewers. Can you beat separate ways with only your fists? The mission to insert our fists into Sadler was officially a go, and we begin this arduous task with Wesker infiltrating the castle with two clear objectives. The first was to break Luis out of his prison cell and passive-aggressively grab his face to ask calmly for the Amber's location. Smoking's a dirty habit, Luis. Do the pictures on the back not put you off? And the second was to make America fist again. Get up, cocksuckers, it's all over. As all of us Resident Evil regulars know, Wesker is unbelievably OP. And with the ability to bitch slap the leader of the BSAA, someone whose biceps could eclipse the sun, it would come as no surprise that Wesker didn't need anything but his bare hands to complete this mission. The rules here were simple. Only Wesker's melee moves from mercenaries could be used for the entirety of this professional playthrough. And to be honest, I felt a huge amount of pity for anyone who stood in Wesker's way. I mean, just imagine being a 50-year-old farmer. You've got a receding hairline. Your disabled chicken barely lays any eggs in your heavily mortgaged shed. Your wife resents your very existence. And to top it all off, you had parasites flowing through your lower intestines. And somehow you think that you could do anything to stop the Umbrella Aryan Master Race project from exploding through your body like the Kool-Aid Man. It was delusion of the highest order. So when Pisanta, Salazar's half housekeeper, half lobster beefcake bodyguard, tried to head us off at the castle entrance, Wesker body slammed her into the shadow realm before she could even click a little crab noise out of her mouth. <laughs> See, this is why Wesker sent Ada. If he was here, the DLC would have been over in 10 minutes and quite frankly, would have been difficult to justify the seven pound price tag. After our casual religious cleansing of the courtyard blockade, we provide some ASMR crossbow murder before we head down to the quarry to meet with Luis, our portable amber sniffer dog. The quarry was Wesker's least favorite area, mainly due in part to all the boulders here, which were just a constant reminder of Chris. But despite the Redfield-induced PTSD, the guards at the gate were about as effective at stopping us as essential oils would be at trying to treat Ebola. Our dismantling of the village defenses continued through to the cabin, where nobody was safe from the hands of justice. Despite his borderline psychotic methodology, Wesker was a man of equality and we didn't discriminate. Man, woman, pig or cow, everyone in this village had qualified for a free fisting on the house. Oh, fuck. With the church area now locally saturated with our fists, there was no sign of Luis at the rendezvous, but for those that missed it, you can actually see him being carried away in his bag, ready to be placed in the basement of the house at the fishing village. Alone and with time to spare, Wesker decided to use this free time productively and rang the church bell to help begin cultivating his own following. If the right to be a god truly was to be ours, we needed bodies, and what better way to get them by stealing them from Sadler? This type of psychological warfare would be instrumental in defeating Sadler. How would you feel if a man came into your own religious community and began stealing your own followers outside of your own church? It would be like Tom Cruise walking up to Pope Frank in the Vatican and asking all the Catholics to join the Church of Top Gun. Don't touch me! This move had big BD energy, but despite my compelling argument to the people of Pueblo... Ladies and gentlemen, has it ever occurred to you that this planet is overpopulated. Only a handful of humans truly matter. Everyone else is just so much chaff. So now I have to separate this chaff from the wheat. And with Ouroboros, you can become that wheat. None of them were interested in what I had to say. A possible side effect of the Plaga, or simply an obsession with today's bingo game. Are you gonna read that number? Am I a joke to you? Here I am, offering you my precious time, and you waste it by playing bingo. After our murderous rampage, we pass the merchant who, like some desperate MLM pyramid scheme peddler, implores us to invest in some of his wares. I have some new goods that might interest you. I don't need anyone else. I've got my two knuckle sandwiches right here. On arriving in the town centre, Pisanta requested a rematch, and in line with Pueblo's Sexual Equality Act of 1984, 
we were obligated to accept. But even with her weaponized sleep paralysis demons, the matchup was like Mike Tyson fighting a child who had no hands. After committing more Verdugo misogyny, we head to Mendez's Playboy Mansion where we listen intently on as Leon gets smacked around in the bedroom below. I can't believe I have to know you forever! And you're fucking insane! And you're fucking winning! You're such a dick! Every day I wake up and I hope you're dead! Unfortunately for Leon, we didn't really have any interest in him or what he was doing here, so we do nothing to help him. And after an uncomfortable amount of time, we watch Mendez leave, shortly followed by Leon, meaning we could now head inside to begin our search for the Amber. We tear the place apart, and despite finding a live chicken and their child in the oven, there was nothing else here. There was no Amber, no clues, and no Louise. But a note in the chief's drawer suggested that we might find him at an abandoned factory close by. Wait, what's that noise? On our way out, it was made clear that the chief didn't actually have gobstoppers for eyes and had evidently seen me on the roof before he left earlier. <laughs> Due to the chief's alpha male religiously blessed physique, he was completely immune to our charm and were promptly evicted from Mendez's house against our will. Power of Christ compels you! Oh, does it? Taking out our frustrations on his neighbors waiting outside. We slip through the gate to the abandoned factory where it becomes increasingly apparent that to qualify for guard duty here, you had to have severe learning difficulties. With no Luis and no clues and constant scam calls coming in through the radio. Do you want free chicken nuggets? As we were getting ready to leave, another group of soon-to-be victims rocked up, apparently ready to adopt eternal darkness. Do you two ever tire of failing in your mission? You've really become quite an inconvenience for me. Oh shit. And before they even had time to get those chainsaws warmed up, we turned the Bella sister and Salvador's insides into their outsides. With chainsaw guts all over us as we left the factory, our vision started to blur. Wesker had been aware of the potential for this to happen. His powers, which were drawn from his T-virus infection, if overused, could leave his body unstable, and his overexertion in the village had left him on the brink of collapse. Despite our failing body, we make it back to Mendez's house to rest up temporarily and regain our strength. Now, one lesser known side effect from Wesker's second coming of Christ in the Arclay Mountains all those years ago was that he had developed a personality disorder. There were in fact two Weskers present at all times. The reincarnated Wesker, the living physical embodiment of his ruthless ambition, and the original Wesker, a conservative and meticulous planner and tactician, restrained to only be a figment of Wesker's imagination. It was a perfect balance, as all things were, and it was also nice for both Weskers to connect over their shared hatred of Chris. And they say talking to yourself was the first sign of madness. With the shared hatred of the Redfield bloodline now off our chest, albeit temporarily, and the T-Virus now sufficiently stabilized, we head through the village and arrive to find a crowd descending on Luis and Leon in the cabin. If we made it over the bridge and WWE body slammed all the villagers and squeezed the location of the Abra out of Luis, we could wrap this all up within the hour. However, halfway across the bridge, the ground begins to shake. Episode four of My 600 Pound Life was being filmed in Pueblo and the star of the show, El Gigante was being led towards Luis's cabin with the intention of using his face as a toilet. Now, we couldn't let anybody kill Luis before we tickled the Amber's location out of him. So without even a warm up, we snapped the giant's legs in half, crippling him to the floor before landing a powerful hit to the creature's weak spot, its testicles. In that time, Luis had vanished from the cabin, but we were able to track him down en route back to Salazar's castle. Luis, so nice of you to show up. You never change. Your feeble attempts only delay the inevitable. Fuck As Luis tried to all F4 himself via carbon monoxide poisoning, we drag him out of his office before he can be cremated, and as we considered which body part to remove first, Luis tells us to wait. He knew something. Luis was aware of our struggles to stabilize the T-virus, so to spare his life temporarily whilst he retrieved the amber, he offered to create us a prototype compound that he'd labeled PG67A as a down payment for his life. The drug, taken in specific quantities, could help keep the T-virus in check and ensure that Wesker's strength and speed remain stable and optimized. Damn, boy. Damn, boy! This piqued Wesker's interest, but came with a proviso that we help Luis collect the ingredients needed for him to make this compound. Whilst not being particularly happy with being forced to become an overqualified grocery shopper for Luis, Wesker could forego its unacceptable nature as it was something that had the potential to benefit the one thing he cared about. That's right. 
It's me. Arriving at the first ingredients location, we reach Wesker's first problem of the run. A concept that was wholly unfamiliar to us so far. Despite having the strongest body, the biggest brain, and being an unstoppable force of nature, it turns out that all of that meant nothing when it came to turning the dials up here to unlock the ink drawer. Why is it always the goddamn puzzles? But it would need to be counted, and Wesker has to pull out his pistol to hit the sequence and reveal the ink. Once retrieved, we depart immediately to avoid any unnecessary social situations with Leon. We still had a long way to go, and our social battery was already reaching critical levels. To make matters worse, we were then immediately forced into our next pistol usage in the drill trap. Some of these symbols have a pulley that we can use to activate the switch, but obviously some of them just had to be out of reach or locked behind some of the gates, unfortunately forcing us to have to shoot them to escape from the trap unscathed. On the other hand, we had no trouble grabbing the silver and gold bottles and are able to reforge the metallic saucepans guarding them into tiny little commemorative pins without any problem. The Moon Emblem Thief throws more non-consensual religious indoctrination at us, thinking ironically that he and his goons had trapped us in the maze. None of you seem to understand. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. With the average life expectancy reaching a maximum of 20 seconds in the maze, we retrieve the emblem with ease, unlock the door, and locate the blue butterfly, the final ingredient Luis needed to be able to construct the first prototype of PG-67A. But before Luis can deliver on the amber, we're chased and separated by Pisanta, where the sexual tension between these two had now become physically palpable. You're gonna make me act up. <laughs> you don't make me do so, I'm gonna regret. We couldn't let Luis dip on us again without delivering the goods, so we speed run through the castle in an attempt to catch him up, entering the sewers and forcibly choking the life out of each Navistador we found. We empty the proverbial castle bathtub and find the Plaga Adonis of Los Illuminados, the Garridors guarding the way. Their beautifully enhanced abs and armoured exteriors made our attacks feel like we were punching in our dreams. Their claws were razor sharp and the violence of their berserker strength meant that they could spread my cheeks and split me in half in the blink of an eye. Several deaths and T-Virus reanimations later, the only way we could get this to work was by thinning out the rest of the zealots flooding into the area. Once pacified, the chessboard was now set. We would now need to be patient, a trait wholly unfamiliar to Wesker, but one we would need to quickly adopt. The plan was to separate the two Garridors out and adopt a hit and run strategy, whereby a single elbow to the back, sack or crack would be applied before we would dip out and return to complete step one until death was achieved. It was now a war of Garridor attrition and after what felt like three years we eventually forced the first Garridor to pass away from old age before the remaining one, isolated, alone, scared, could be given a double serving of spaghetti pummel naze. <laughs> God, what the fuck? As we headed over to the smelting area, we could sense that we were being watched. I can smell you. Hiding in the rafters above us like some kind of sex offender waiting to expose themselves to us, Pasanta jumped out of her hiding space looking to make amends for the previous bitch slaps that she'd received. A little known fact was that combining a Pasanta with a hundred ton staircase caused an evolutionary state to begin. She'd begun evolving, turning into something more, adapting to become something unstoppable. At least, that's what she thought. Wesker, unfortunately, was a fighting type and everyone had a weakness to being fisted, so we finished you free up in a matter of seconds. Despite the ease of authorizing you free's application for death, Wesker's T-Virus levels had become unstable again, and with his healing factor diminished, the acid attack from you free had left lasting damage to Wesker's left arm. This damage to his pristine Aryan body was but a small price to pay for complete global saturation, and by fashioning a makeshift bandage from his boxes and by using his belt as a tourniquet, we progress on. Top the cargo container, seeing Luis die a painful death in front of his eyes upset Wesker, as it now meant that the amber was lost. Despite being a pawn in Wesker's wider game, Luis had his uses, but whilst we were pondering our next move, we spot the amber in the hands of one of Sadler's agents, Jack Krauser. We were in hot pursuit, we couldn't afford any further delays, and without the amber, we were facing the prospect of failure. And with the plan in its final stages, delays were something that Wesker wouldn't tolerate. We clear out the catacombs of all combatants and reaffirm my absolute undying hatred of the crossbow enemy pool. Case in point being this guy as his attack pushes me back perfectly underneath the crusher, flattening me into a Jill sandwich. On top of Salazar's sacrificial altar, we watch a friendly homicide unfold as Leon shoots an unarmed child in the face. Jesus, even that's a bit too much for me. Despite being hot on his heels, Krauser slips through our fingertips, so we grab the boat keys and speed over to the island to head him off. Which unfortunately meant Leon now had no boat and was forced to brave the strong currents of the ice cold island sea as he swam over. Here it goes! We finally tracked down Krauser, but we were too late. 
watching on helplessly as he delivered the amber into Sadler's hand. This was the worst possible situation we could be in. We trained our stingray on Sadler's face. We'd have to go loud and take the entire group down now if we wanted to stand any chance of retrieving the amber. Did you forget Wesker? You're doing a fist-only challenge, so don't even think about sniping anybody. You may have not noticed, but Sadler isn't the only one with a dominant plaga. Interesting. He was right. It was time to pivot. We grab our Chromebook and head off to the island comms tower to initiate plan B. We arrive in Krause's encampment and catch a lift down to the bulldozer section where we assign out stage 4 diabetes to all soldiers infested in the local area. In the vents above the lab, we stumble across Leon guarding the president's daughter like a good dog. Now, answer me this. What could scare an immortal master race human bankrolled by the most profitable pharmaceutical company on earth and powered by the most sophisticated biological virus known to man? Nothing would be the normal answer except for the lab. This place, reminiscent of a typical NHS ward in Hackney, was the epitome of survival horror and gave Wesker Arclay Mountain Lab PTSD. But heading into the lab had its benefits. It gave us the opportunity to see what work we could plagiarize from the cult, starting with a potential contender for the ultimate life form. You look lonely. I can fix that. This was the specimen we'd been looking for, the perfect organism. We unfortunately couldn't open the case ourselves to further inspect this fine being, so we got our friends next door to do it for us. On closer inspection, it was disappointing. The Regenerador was susceptible to limb amputation, had chronic flatulence, <coughs> low intelligence, and like me, in the eyes of most women, it was nothing short of pathetic. Sure, it had a rear that was built like a reversing dump truck, which had its benefits. Get this shit off me! But this wasn't the utopian vision Wesker had for his repopulation of Earth. The search would have to continue, and Wesker, in a fit of T-virus-induced rage, dismantled the remaining Regenerators in the lab arm by arm, but took note of their impressive regenerative capabilities. Despite thinking this was a bust, we reached a possible comeback for the species, the Iron Maiden. Seven minutes. Seven minutes is all I can spare to play with you. Your future hinges upon this fight. This upgraded Regenerador, codenamed Steve Harris, was majestic. It was highly durable, had increased resilience to body part separation, and had the perfect counter to our CQB. It was an unstoppable force of artificial nature. <clears throat> but it wasn't invulnerable. It did bleed, which, as we know, meant that you could kill it. But I'd quickly spent well over my seven minute allocation here, and with multiple holes now pierced into my Armani waistcoat, Wesker's patience had quickly expired here, so we maneuver past it and progress with the mission. No more time for games, Iron Maiden. I've got work to do. We jump aboard the gondola and it was apparent that Sadler was no longer sending his best. We'd reached the murky limescale water at the bottom of the kettle when it came to soldier quality, and as we watched these trogs delete brain cells from one another, we're given some stone cold foreshadowing of Wesker's demise when we find out that our block ability had a limit of anything over a crossbow bolt, like an RPG for example. As a last ditch attempt to stop us, the island garrison had thrown everything they had to defend the comms facility. They had Death Star turrets scanning the route up ahead and an entire garrison of enemies protecting the route through to the facility. Perhaps this might actually make it an even fight. Observing the turret, apparently the only way through was to take incremental cover until we reached this wall, but that was what normies like Chris or Leon would do. This was Wesker, and it gives us the opportunity to showcase the other power we had in our locker. Like the Flash, but minus the all-round marketing disaster, we take Route 1 up the main path past the turrets and begin our fight with the garrison on the hill. Isn't this one big family reunion? I think the odds are fair. One on 28. Right, Jill. Oh, yeah, that's right. Jill's not here. Maximum effort. Stop trying to hit me and hit me. 
Without a single hair even falling out of place and the final army defeated, we head over the final bridge defence and arrive at the comms facility. Whilst the smell and sight of death was pungent in the air for Wesker, this was just another Tuesday. We search for any documentation or research of value left behind, but we find nothing. Apart from Sadler's latest creation, Martin, who, despite being completely immune to our attacks, was not something we even needed to trouble ourselves with. We'd now located the server room and we were able to download the entirety of Los Illuminados' research database and initiate our explosive countdown to begin extraction protocol. On making our way to the first exit checkpoint, Martin catches up to us, cornering us between themselves and the laser maze, but showcasing Wesker's superior agility again allows us to float through the high-powered laser grid, something that Big Chungus couldn't do, and we're able to head back to the island in search of the final piece of the puzzle, Sadler and the Amber, or Krauser. Once we arrived at the island, the most logical location for Sadler to be in would be his sanctuary, a heritage site for the Sadler bloodline. If he was going to be anywhere, it would be there. Between here and the throne room, the remaining island garrison were given forcible frontal wedgies, neutralised by the raw, indisputable power that Wesker possessed in his hands. We head up the lift and arrive at the throne room, and as expected, we find Sadler, who seemed to be in the middle of giving Leon the time of his life down there. Pardon, Daddy. What? What? Not interrupting anything. Are we Sadler? Why don't you pick on someone your own size, you creepy old pervert? Luckily for Leon, words may not hurt, but it does distract Sadler long enough for him to grab Ashley and make his escape. This old man was like Spencer. He wasn't worthy to wield the power he'd been given. With our opening move, we hit Sadler so hard that the laws of gravity no longer applied to him and he was stuck standing at a 45 degree angle. Stunned in place, we casually walk around Sadler. You have the right to be a god. You, arrogant even until the end. Only one truly capable of being a god deserves that right. With the Amber, I have that right. And with our final killing blow, he collapsed to the floor with all the grace of Grandpa flying down the stairs of his three-story townhouse, dropping the precious Amber in the process. As we made our way to the extraction point, Sadler had awakened, apparently not defeated, and had begun fighting with Leon in a duel to the death. His new form seemed much more interesting. Too bad he didn't show this kind of resilience in our fight, but it was the perfect distraction to mask our escape. En route out, we found a red rocket launcher lying around in the island's ammo dump. This thing was apparently quite powerful. God, I would not want to be on the receiving end of that. Ah, uh, the poetic irony. After silencing the Brute Brothers for the final time, we run into a slight problem, in that Wesker's path was now blocked by Sadler's massive d With it being out of reach on another section of the crane, none of our attacks could make contact. Even with our super speed, we couldn't beat it to the next area before it arrived. We tested to see if the rocket launcher guy on the platform behind could destroy the tentacle for us, but we were sadly out of luck. The rest of the schlong was impervious to damage, meaning the rocket needed to hit the eye, which at this angle was impossible. We sadly had to sign off with another final pistol usage, but the second tentacle, despite us having some growing time-based concerns, gets the holy Glen beaten out of it. Exiting in the lift, we find the President's daughter watching on ominously to the battle ensuing below. She pleaded with us to help Leon fight Sadler below and save his life. So you've made it this far. Too bad you won't make it much further. Ashley! Look at me! With the red rocket launcher now gone, disintegrating Ashley instead of Sadler, Leon is crushed by Sadler's final attack, and as we made our escape on our helicopter back to the Jeff Bezos super yacht, Amber in hand, the explosion on the island took care of Sadler and any remaining lost Illuminata soldiers, destroying all remnants of the cult's presence and successfully tying off all our loose ends. The death of the president's daughter would certainly have problematic political side effects. Tensions with Spain would be particularly high, but this was of no consequence to Wesker. Soon, the political ecosystem of the world and these insignificant problems would no longer matter. With the Amber, preparations could begin with Tricell on the Uruburus project. The age of men is over. The time of the Orc has come. So, can you beat separate ways with only your fists? Sadly, no. All of the enemies in separate ways did have weak spots that were the convenient size of Wesker's fist, but the puzzles as usual were the bane of our existence and the last tentacle was our final checkmate. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed gamers and I'll just hand over to Wesker for a final word to you on this challenge. Thanks for watching, you fine specimens, and remember, the challenge may be over, but we're just getting started.
Also, if you're watching this and your name's Chris, I fucking hate you.